we go. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to another episode of Untapped Gold Mines. My name is CJ Depardeen and I am from untappedgoldmines.com and this is a ongoing series uh, meant to encourage leaders uh, with new ways of thinking and or reminders of how they can untap their people and their profits within their organizations. And today I could not be more excited than to have these three individuals, um, incredible experts in each of their fields. And um, I'm so grateful to all of you for spending the time here. So I'm going to read these bios out because I don't want to misquote anything and kind of mess it up. So forgive my lack of visibility uh, to you directly in your face for those of you watching video. And for those of you reading or listening, it's fantastic. So I've got on the call today, Brian Ponch Rivera. And Brian, John, and Nigel are all co-creators of the Flow System. Uh, Brian is a founder of CE and CEO of Agile X. Am I saying that correctly? It's AGLX. Yes. AGLX. Okay. Thank you. Consulting, a former F-14 instructor and demonstration team member and captain select in the Navy Reserve. His 16-year active duty military career includes roles in NATO, Air and Space Operations Centers, three geographic combatant commands, and a stint as a foreign area officer. He is a Kinevan Foundation's trainer and often co-leads complexity workshops with the co-creator of Kinevan framework, Dave Snowden. Ponch has worked with the co-creator of the Scrum uh, framework as well, which is Jeff Sutherland, and co-creator of Lean Kanban University, and has led several high-profile digital transformations. He often speaks at Global Agile Scrum and performance conferences on the topics of high reliability, leadership, teamwork, and complex adaptive systems. Following the 2017 incidents at sea, Ponch put his civilian career on hold and volunteered to be a member of the 2018 Strategic Readiness Review Industry Best Practice and Learning Culture Team, where he led engagements with academics and executives on topics of complexity, leadership, teamwork, safety, and culture. As a result of his combined civilian and U.S. Navy expertise in early 2019, uh, Ponch was asked by U.S. Navy leadership to help transform the Naval Safety Center using the same concepts propelling the DevOps movement today, which, boy, oh boy, that is definitely a popular movement today. So we, we know it well. Uh, Nigel. Uh, Nigel is an author, international key keynote speaker, and creator of Scrum the Toyota Way, and the co-creator, again, of the Flow System and CEO of the Flow Consortium. Nigel is the first ever to hold the role of Chief of Agile in Toyota globally. He's developed training and transformation approaches to enable agility in Toyota by combining Scrum with Lean, which achieved global recognition with an award from the World Agility Forum. And Nigel left Toyota at the end of 2019. He was the first professional scrum trainer globally in Toyota and the first trainer to have ever been certified by both the creators of scrum, training over 7,500 people uh, worldwide. Nigel has published several peer reviewed white papers and journal publications on team science and he acts as an advisor on several boards at the University of North Texas. And I'm assuming that's how you and John met, uh, but I will introduce you to John as well, and then we'll kind of make sure that we fill in any of the blanks that I may have missed or corrections that I may uh, need. So John, John Turner is an assistant professor at the University of North Texas in the College of Information. His background is in engineering, where he was employed for 15 years before returning to higher education in pursuit of his PhD. His research interests are in the areas of team science, leadership, complexity, creativity and innovation and theory development. John operates the team science webpage at science-teams.com, is a co-creator of the flow system and the co-author of the flow system guide, the flow system key principles and attributes, and the flow system, the evolution of agile and lean thinking in an age of complexity. And this is the forthcoming book. How'd I do? We sound Please. awesome. <laughs> I think you did all right, but I want Ponch's bio. He sounds so <laughs> Well, this is, I, I think that's enough right there. Let's just 
stop the interview. That was, we're done. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, nobody, nobody needs more. We've got yeah. it all. There's no other reasons to follow, but then to know that you are all very well established. And um, I think it's an honor for all of us to hear from all of you and to learn about your flow system. So tell me briefly, or tell the audience briefly how you all met and decided to start this journey of creating the flow system. I'm going to start with that because my, my yeah. bit's really cool. So okay. Ponch, Ponch and I met really boringly because we were both working with Jeff Sutherland, helping him in different capacities at the time. And Jeff Sutherland is one of the co-creators of Scrum. But right. the more cool thing is how I met John because we moved to Texas about three years ago and I moved with Toyota at the time and from the cold sort of frozen northeast of Massachusetts. Um, I did have to put that in, but we met, we, we sort of, we were looking for a pet sitter and my wife was sort of wondering, we live in a very small, tiny town. There's no stoplights in our town. And uh, she went into the, the senior center and just asked some of the ladies in there in the senior center, would anybody like to pet sit? And this lady says, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. So we got very, very good friends with this lady called Jackie, surname Turner. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, we were going out of town for an extended period. We we're going to Europe for two or three weeks and Jackie was gonna stay at the house. And so John came to check us out to make sure we were okay for his mother to stay at the house. Uh, and actually it was during those conversations that we realized that we were actually both working in the same space. And so I got, I invited John into Toyota and then we struck up a, a combined uh, sort of love of what we were doing between Toyota and the University of North Texas. And that relationship built and continued with a lot of cool stuff with Toyota. And then subsequently, as I became the CEO of the Flow Consortium and decided to leave Toyota, of course, we've continued to work really closely together. So that's how I got to know these guys. And of course, Ponch got to know John because of the relationship that we had together. And, uh, and in really my dining room, as they'll tell you, was where the flow system, the genesis of the flow system was created. John doesn't live too far from me. So uh, Ponch used to come in and stay and we'd uh, spend uh, weekends and many hours in my uh, dining room with post-it notes all over the, oh, yeah, a lot of that, and post-it notes all over the wall. Uh, and that's where the, uh, the flow system genesis came about. Excellent. Okay. And so I think what I've come to learn from coaching many leaders across the globe, that one of the biggest things that most leaders want to know when a new system or a new methodology, a new approach, or, you know, a new thing is proposed is what are the problems we're trying to solve? So who wants to take this one with the flow system? What are the problems we're trying to solve? Go on, Paul. <laughs> Go on, lad. Uh, you want me to take some? Uh, wow. Well, um, I think everything in, in, in any industry, the problems are pretty much the same. We're, we're humans, right? And uh, resilience from, you know, to, to safety, to agility, to innovation, to lethality, they're really the same um, when you think about it. It's not about the technology. It's really about the, the humans, the interaction, the quality of the interactions, not so much the quality of the individual, but the interactions that are there. And I think what the organizations are trying to solve at the end of the day are all the same. It's, it's how do we deliver value to the customer? How do we serve those uh, that we need to? Like in the military, how do we serve those uh, on the front line, the families? Uh, for our governments, how do we serve our people? Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really the same. We're humans. And humans generally have the same challenges. How do you communicate? How do we do planning? How do we, uh, you know, how do we mission debrief? Um, how do we build situational awareness? How do we make sense of our environment? It's relatively the same. So um, I think that's the, uh, the power of the flow system is I can apply it to complex adaptive systems and option trading in, in the market or working with uh, fighter pilots to teach them how to be more effective in the, in the air or working with uh, digital transformations. So right. yeah, it's all the same. Excellent. Uh, I would add, one thing in there. So what differentiates the flow system from other existing models such as Agile and Lean is that we focus more on operating and managing in complex environments, uh, ambiguous problems, uncertainty, unknowns. So we're focusing more on the complex domain rather than simple and complicated. So that's part of the complexity of thinking is known 
what type of problem or environment you're you're facing with and the tools and techniques that you use for complicated are not the same that you're using complexity and so the flow system provides options for people to go to in that complex domain right i'm, I'm going to simplify that a little bit as well because i had a i had a long sort of very fortunate career in the lean world so the toyota production system world in and out of that world and then as Ponch did when we spend a lot of time around the agile leaders of the world like Jeff Sutherland, Ken Schwaber and others, I was able to sort of absorb a lot of the teachings from the agile world. And, and a lot of that's based upon the Toyota thinking. A lot of that goes all the way back to sort of hundreds of years ago to empirical thinking and inductive learning. But I sort of got to the point where I realized that within the Toyota production system and, and the sort of West calls that lean, this subtly different different elements to it, but let's just talk about it as lean thinking. There, was, there were challenges in extending that beyond linear thinking, beyond standardized repeatable process. Fantastic for optimizing a manufacturing process, any process, it's a standardized repeatable process where we can have standard work, where we repeat that, we can optimize that, and operational excellence experts are very, very grounded in that. And there's a lot of deep teachings within the Toyota production system. I don't mean to diminish that at all. It's incredibly important, hence why it's at the foundation of what we call the flow system. But then we realized that we were dealing with problems that were not linear in nature. They weren't predictable, they're just un unpredictable. And so we needed to start embracing complexity thinking. Now, most complexity thinkers, and Punch mentioned our friend Dave Snowden, Professor Snowden, creator of Kinevin. The problem with complexity thinkers, they use words that even I pick up the dictionary and start thumbing through to try and understand what they mean. And I've actually literally done it while Dave and I have sat on the same couch having a beer together. I've been looking on my phone what he's talking about. <laughs> right. um, and that's true. And then there's a significant, the other two elements that were missing were that leaders were still working in very command and control, very, I decide what we do, you guys go do what you're told, please give us reports. And when you don't do those things very well, we'll say bad things to you, we'll be punitive in some way. Um, and so the old styles of command and control management were missing, but going the whole hog to the holacracy movement, which is the lunatics running the asylum, was also too far the other way. And then, of course, where Ponch comes in, incredible amount of knowledge and skill is in high-performing teams. I mean, he flew for, for his living, and his life and many others depended upon incredibly high-performance teams, high-reliability organizations, and high levels of teamwork and capability, and also high levels of psychological safety and the ability to say no when there was a problem. And so I started to look at all these things. I'd, so the Agile folks have been talking about complexity sort of a bit for a while, or complex product development, which is where they were focused. And, and all these things were very disparate. And I'd started spending a lot of time with both Ponch and with John, and we were talking about all these problems. And we were looking at what people like Dave Marquette was doing with uh, intent-based leadership, or what he calls commander's yep. intent. We're looking at what Dr. Amy Edmondson was doing with the psychological safety and the books that she was writing in her career in making an organization psychological, psychologically safe. And so we started to look at the sort of team science areas where John was doing deep, deep sort of professorial studies, if that's the right word, but deep learning there. Punch has been the practitioner doing it for real. And my life in this lean world and seeing all the challenges and we were, okay, we need to bring this stuff together. And, and the deep studies and the stuff that John did with me and Toyota and that Ponch got heavily involved in, we started to see there was a deeply interconnected nature between yeah. leadership and team science, complexity thinking, and hey, good old Toyota production system, lean thinking. This is incredibly valuable in many contexts. And that was the key thing context determines approach and tools there's many tools techniques methods approaches but there's no one size fits all framework and actually people are like zoom we're all becoming zoombies because we've got you know zoom fatigue or webinar fatigue and people watching this will feel that but we're also getting framework fatigue everybody comes out every few years with a new framework that says this is this will solve you know all the problems of humankind and so we didn't create a framework what we created was a system of learning and understanding. We needed to get people to focus on customer value, the flow of value, getting things that people want, 
delivered to the people who want them. The people who perceive value, we need to deliver that value as quickly as possible. This is the concept of flow of value. But we realized that to do that, we had to bring together these very different areas because we needed new leadership. We needed empowerment and proper teams and multi-team systems. We needed to understand how to solve complex problems as opposed to simple linear problems. But we needed all of these things in different combinations, in different interconnected ways, depending on the context. Because aviation is very different context to artificial intelligence, which is very different to healthcare. But all the concepts apply, but in different ways and in different combinations. And the flow system highlights a combination of different types of things that people can learn and understand, different techniques, different methods, approaches. We don't prescribe how to use any of them in any particular context. What we say is this is what we need to understand in these interconnections and decide how to apply them in those individual contexts. So that's sort of how this came together. And I think it's time to let the others talk now. <laughs> Right. So that brings up a question that I have, and that is two questions, actually. One, you know, can you summarize for our listeners what constitutes a complex environment or a complex adaptive system? Uh, and two, how do leaders make a decision when they're in that system about what they need to do with it? like how they respond to it, because it is 100% context driven. Uh, we know that much, those of us who have been, you know, through this complex adaptive system and Kinevin framework training. So who would like to take that one away? <laughs> John. Well, I'll jump in that, I guess. Brian, did you want? I, I'll, I'll take go. a quick one. I'll take a quick stab, which is a, a knuckle draggers approach to it. So the, uh, the, the, the fighter jet over here, the F-14, is a complicated system. We know that uh, when you start the engines, it should do certain things, uh, even though the aircraft doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a complex adapted system is when you put a crew in that, uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we have humans that are going to do things because we're human. Um, generally, we can predict some things in there, but for the most part, there's, there's some interesting, interesting things that may or may not happen. So uh, there's, there's uh, many people that came before us that said, you know, mayonnaise is a, uh, is, a, is a complex system and a jet engine is a complicated system. And there are reasons for that. Now, John's going to give you a better answer than that with more science. But like I said, the knuckle dragger in me is going to say, words. yeah, the knuckle dragger, <laughs> complicated, complex. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when you describe complexity, say in an organizational form, you look at a hierarchical chart. So when you have a company that smaller company that has two or three hierarchical levels, that's complicated, but there's a lot of different, a few levels and number uh, lines of communication required to go from the bottom levels up to the top executive levels. And then when you get to a multinational corporation, you look at a hierarchical chart for that and you have pages of levels. And the lines right. of communication required to go from the bottom rung to the very top CEO is, is nearly impossible and never occurs in, in real life. And so that, that's kind of an explanation of complexity. It can occur naturally, but most of the complexity that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is human-derived. We right. develop the structures of the organization, the multiple levels of hierarchy that have communications lines that cannot reach one level to the bottom level. So when we're dealing with complexity, what we want to do is reduce those communication levels so that the decision-making authority is at the people closest to the work. And that's often in today's organizations, that's often the team level. Right. And so how does that differ from, if at all, holacracy or a flat org structure? Nigel well, did bring up holacracy being like the far extreme. So let's clarify where the difference is if we can. So what would, so let's try and talk about this in, in terms of organizations, because that's probably the most important area. And that's where John was heading. In holacracy, basically there is no centralized management at all. There is no control and, and Zappos recently famously decided to move back towards a command and control structure. They tried 
their version of holacracy, which basically meant everybody just go do their own thing. Sort of like a commune effectively, yeah, where it'll just right. sort of function. And at the opposite extreme, you've got a very deeply hierarchical command and control structure. And actually, Toyota is a very deeply hierarchical command and control structure. We can talk about the lessons from Toyota production system and psychological safety there. But as a management organization, it's very deep. It's a, very, it's a global organization, circa half a million people. It's in uh, numerous countries globally. The complexities of managing that organization are extremely high. But what happens, and this is where I've talked a little bit about work that Herr Hofstad had done in Holland on the power distance index, when the distance between the people doing the work and the distance between the people making the decisions becomes too great, things become disconnected. Intent becomes disconnected. The right decisions aren't made timely enough. So, and, and one of the, and I've used this phrase many, many times, ask yourself how long it takes to get a new laptop in your company. And if the decision-making process turns into weeks, sometimes months, you have a problem because the people who need the tools are unable to make those decisions to be able to gain access to those tools. So in a distributed leadership construct, rather than fully hierarchical top-down management or in a fully holocratic method, which is everybody just figuring out what to do randomly with little control. What we propose is a distributed leadership model, which is a sort of a hybrid between the two. And I hate the term hybrid because people then start thinking hybrid agile and hybrid scrum. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about there are certain decisions that are better made by the people closest to the work. And as David Marquette says in his speeches, move the authority to where the information is. And as long as you've got two things in place, the competencies and the clarity. So do the people have the right competencies? Can they do the task work? Can they carry out the activities competently, safely, and with a high standard of quality? But do they have the clarity, the where for all, the, the right decision-making opportunities? So they make the right decisions for the right reasons. They don't make them for bad reasons. They're not bad actors. They're people who understand what the decisions should be made, when they should make them. And then we decentralize that decision-making down to the teams that are better placed, closer to the information, closer to the work. So that's what we're proposing. Well, that's what I, we, it's not that we're proposing it. That's what distributed leadership proposes. And the models that we've defined in the, in the, uh, the flow system, and, and I'll let John talk more about this, uh, are to enable distributed leadership to work effectively in a company. We still need some levels of hierarchy. We still have to make payroll. We still have to do legal and regulatory. We still have to look after workers' rights and, and other aspects of running a, bit, running in a business like facilities management. So there are things that are still necessary there. Um, but there are the type of work we do, which is the, in, the, you know, in this agile space or the space where companies want to move to greater agility, it means we need small teams interacting with each other effectively, making decisions on the fly, making the right decisions for the right reasons and implementing them quickly so organizations can pivot fast when markets change, when markets are disrupted, when crises like the one with the coronavirus we're in at the moment happen. They can make decisions quickly on the fly and it doesn't take a Nokia five-year plan to put them immediately out of business. So that's sort of the, the balance between the two. John, you know a little bit more about the, the, the distributed leadership model. I don't know if you wanted to add any comment there. Yeah, well, we're, we're not necessarily proposing flat structures, but we want organizations to be flat -ter. That's the first thing. The other thing, when we're talking about distributed leadership, we're really, what we found in some of the research is that a lot of the agile practices, implementations and organizations failed in part because of leadership, but that in turn is also part of the, the leadership structure. So you, you come in, you do uh, change your part of your organization to team-based structures, but you have a leadership structure above it that operates under normal conditions that doesn't take into account the needs of, of teams. So what, what we propose in the distributed leadership is a structure from top to bottom that accommodates and supports, fosters team practices, team-based structures. So when you look at the very bottom, you have individual self-leadership 
development. And then from there, we go to a team team level. And within the teams, we operate, we propose a shared leadership model for, for individual teams so they can operate autonomously. And then when you have groups of teams together on one single product or project, then we, we bunch them into more of a multi-team system uh, structure. And when the, within the multi-team system, you have uh, the leader, which we call the boundary spanner. They manage the boundary around the teams. So they're looking at the teams still operate autonomously, but the boundary spanner supports the interactions between teams and between the team and the multi-team system. So the teams have their goals within the, their own team, and they also have a goal related to the multi-team system, and that's how they're in alignment with the organizational goals. And then once you get above the multi-team system at the executive levels, in order for upper management to support team structures, we identified leadership theories that support complexity in teams, and we identified strategic leadership, instrumental leadership, and global leadership. And so we we identified what each of those are and, and I highlighted the different components of those leadership theories and we're just recommending organizations to choose and select parts that make sense to them so that they you don't take just strategic or just instrumental, but you choose the parts that make sense for your organization so that you can provide support for the team. And that that's in a nutshell, that's kind of what we we turn the distributed leadership. Yeah, I, I want to just add a comment there because this is a really important thing about leadership. Mm -hmm. Is leadership need to be participatory and engaged, not blessing and blaming. That's not empowerment. That's just telling somebody to go do something and blaming them when it doesn't work out the way they perceived it should work out. And so we want leaders to be more participatory and engaged. We want leaders to change their behaviors from telling people what to do and then expecting status reports and then when the outcomes aren't as they desired sort of kicking up a storm and blaming people and implementing punitive measures this is not how this is meant to work and the reason there's a couple of visual cues in the the flow system even though there appears to be three pillars because and we built a house because lean people like houses and toyota <laughs> people like toyota houses but we didn't want to build a temple uh, with big stone sort of silo, uh, silos of vertical pillars. So what you actually see is three strands of DNA. And in each, each sort of strand is highlighted in a bold color to indicate the three key disciplines of complexity thinking, distributed leadership and team science. And we sort of talked about how these three, three things must combine, which creates what we call the triple helix of flow, or we've coined it the DNA of organizations. This sort of new triple strand of DNA. But the important thing is here, we put leadership in the middle still, because if you remove good leadership, the whole damn thing comes tumbling down. So we still wanted that metaphor there. But the other thing is with the internet interconnected nature, leadership need to be a team. And the majority of organizations I've been into and, and facilitated, uh, I have a, a technique, and I won't disclose the technique here, but I have a technique that takes 12 minutes. We ask six questions of leaders. We put them through a participatory exercise. There's no biasing or heuristics. There's no sort of cognitive loading there. And they just basically participate in this, this exercise we design. And in 12 minutes, we prove several things. We prove leadership of the problem, or rather, they prove that leadership of the problem. They also identify quite clearly they're not a leadership team. They're a collecting, collection of people who call themselves leaders who have executive job titles. Uh, but they're not actually leading and they're not actually teaming. Uh, and this other component of complexity thinking is, hey, leadership, you really need to understand complexity thinking and weak signal detection and sense making, because how do you know when the bad thing's going to come before it arrives? That's complexity thinking in a nutshell. So you need to understand this. So the, the combination of these, and when you get this figured out, hey, guess what? That foundational level of lean thinking from TPS will help you do it in a standardized, repeatable manner. We don't want to be living in complexity. That's confusing and uncertain and volatile and, and very ambiguous. We want to actually drag them or drag the problems out of that into a controllable, complex world, as Ponch was saying, you know, about the aircraft, so a complicated world about the aircraft, where we have known variables with checklists we can follow in a standardized, repeatable way. 
Um, so it's really, really important for leadership to understand this isn't something that they can take this like another framework and give it to the organization and say, hey, teams of people, go do this flow thing. Because that's not what it's meant to be. It's not meant to be a prescriptive, a follow the instructions and it will work because it won't. And that was not how Toyota's production system was ever meant. TPS was not a, a, a playbook. It was a collection of techniques and tools and methods, approaches, philosophies, that when used in a certain way in certain contexts was very effective and very valuable in a linear thinking context. And so what we're trying to say is that this is, these are the things that you need to understand. Please take these things, learn how to apply them in your context. The book, of course, when it's out and probably in the next couple of months, we, we, we think it will be out and ready. We're in the final throes of doing all the things that publishers expect you to do. But um, bless John, he's doing all the hard work. Uh, <laughs> but once the book is out, it will go a little bit deeper into these different constructs. But if anybody's expecting an ABC123 recipe, that's not what it's going to be because working in different contexts and in complexity, there is no fixed recipe. There's just knowledge, tools, methods, approaches, and experiences and patterns that help us construct what is necessary and appropriate within your context to establish the most important thing, the flow of value to the people who perceive your value and are willing to keep funding your company by buying your products and services. You lose sight of this, doesn't matter how, you can be very efficient delivering zero value. So we really need to get people to understand that, the constructs of that. CJ. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit. So if I can summarize as, as best as I can, because it's not a, I'm not going to take a lot of time up because you filled in so many wonderful gaps, but that triple helix of complexity, uh, distributed leadership and team science, critical to the success of this. And what I'm also hearing is that it's an adaptive type of approach or system that enables those organizations that are adopting this kind of DNA triple helix approach to apply what is valuable to the context that they are in and therefore transfer the value to the end customer, whether that's an internal customer or an external customer. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that you've kind of brought up a couple of times through this conversation is this idea that, <laughs> and this is a bit of a controversial idea, and I've seen this play out many times as a facilitator and a coach to executives and senior leadership teams. Leadership teams tend to think that they are a team when in reality, they're a group of people carrying out their own goals and objectives. Um, and maybe haven't even been taught how to team. So I know that the flow system plays a really big role in teaching teamwork and teaming. So can one of you speak to that? Because that I think is one of those things that, you know, when I've observed and coached people through digital transformations, there's a few common themes that happen. One, um, you know, we weren't equipped to be successful in this because we didn't have all the training, right? Uh, we don't know who to talk to for what because we're all distributed and we're all all over the place. Our teams are constantly forming, storming, and norming because we're always bringing in new members and we're providing mobility and all this kind of stuff. Um, and we don't even know if we're a team. Like this person has this skill and this person has this, that skill and we all need to work together and leverage those skills, but we're not really a team. So how do we create that teamwork from the team level all the way up to that leadership level so that we can truly unlock flow? Cause that's what your whole system is about, right? I'm looking at the Navy boy here. Uh, right. So you got to remember a lot of folks get promoted, not because of their teaming skills or their leadership skills, they get promoted right. because of their technical skills. And if you look at the data, the data suggests that, uh, you know, that one out of 10 folks have the natural ability to lead two out of 10 or the other two out of 10 can actually learn how to lead seven out of 10. Uh, you're pretty much useless. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to add any value to organization. And so if you think about the hierarchy in your organization, those people that are getting promoted are calling themselves leaders, but they're not really leaders. Um, they're technical experts that are trying to work together as wrestlers. Um, so even though their context says we need to play games like basketball or soccer or, or even American football, 
uh, they're track stars uh, running their own individual race against each other. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what's happening in organizations right now. Uh, and you can teach them some basic fundamental leadership skills uh, through teaming. And, and that's, you know, how do you, how do you elicit uh, input from others? How do you create the psychologically safe environment to, to hear what others have to say, the active listening? Uh, a lot of things that are on the right pillar or the right uh, helix uh, of uh, the flow system are applicable to the distributed leadership piece. So, uh, you know, when I stepped out of the cockpit, um, we learned team science, if you will, uh, from human factors, from aviation crew resource management. We learned the basics of how to work together as a team. And uh, when you leave that tactical level, uh, you, you go right back into this environment where it's just a, it's a free for all really. And, and <laughs> it's, it's absolutely embarrassing to find out that, um, when you get into an organization, people don't know the fundamentals of how to communicate, uh, how to listen, how to do basic planning, how do you anticipate the future. And what's worse is when you look at the old scrum guide, uh, which says, uh, and I'll use this as an example, what I do yesterday, what am I doing today, and what impediments from our way, uh, I would ask any family to, try to, to plan a, a, a vacation in the future using that. And I want to, you know, you'll, you'll see how awful a planning approach that is. So um, what we want to do is really instill these, uh, these mental models, if you will, of, of high-performing teams inside of organizations. It's, it, this isn't rocket surgery. You can learn from others, right? You can take lessons, and rocket surgery is a joke, by the way. You can <laughs> okay. laugh. Yeah. Um, you, you can pull these great lessons from other places, and this is a great concept of scaling. If something works in another domain and we understand why it works, you can actually bring it over. And if it scales, well, it works in another domain, then therefore it scales, right? So I'll give you an example. I can't take scaled agile framework and go apply it to a, a fighter squadron. It just won't scale, right? I, I can't apply it to a bunch of surgeons. It won't scale. And there, there's, you know, so you blow things out of the water like that. Uh, so there's a long way to say, um, Yes, you get promoted because your technical skills, not because your leadership skills. So, hey, Ponch, why don't we get in a room with marshmallow, lumps of marshmallow and pasta sticks and learn to team using those type of techniques? Well, that's fun. If, you know, it, it makes you feel good for about 15 or 18 minutes. Uh, but uh, the, the teaming skills really need time to look back at how you interacted. Uh, you need some time to reflect on the debrief. So you can take that if you want to use the, the marshmallow game uh, and apply it to your, your business. Um, you might have some things you could pull from that, but it's really in the, the reflection, the, the, how did you plan it, it? How did you communicate? It's not, if you built a damn, you know, tower this high or that high and it fell over in, in 20 seconds. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it, you really need, um, uh, experiential learning activities that are applicable to your environment. Uh, so you, you, you know, some folks will push back on Lego. Uh, I'm one of those who go, Hey, you know, that's great. If you're going to play with Lego. But um, uh, what we want are highly interdependent activities that we can see how we team together and, and lead together. Uh, and, and if you think about my world in aviation, we had, the, the, we had simulators to do this thing. We, we got to go fail all the time. You know, 99% of our effort was in learning how to work together as a team and that 1% to go out there and actually do it. Uh, whereas industries are the way around. It's, you get 1% and if you're doing the wrong thing, then that 1% of the time, uh, that 99% is you're going to fail on that quite often. So right. learn how to do the right things uh, right. Right. Yeah. The, I can Go ahead, John. Piggyback on that. So as Ponch was saying, the, the task is where you get promoted, but when people put together teams, uh, they focus on task force and everybody's doing independent tasks and they're calling themselves a team when in reality they're a group. So right. The first step is really knowing when you need a team and what task, independent task work or interdependent task work. If you have some level of interdependency where one team member is reliant on the other team member, then, you, then you're starting to look at, at, at having a team. And then for teams to be effective, task is one component of the team, but there's teamwork. And that's where the communications, the coordination, the cognitions, and so forth come into play. And teams that are formed together for, that have the comp competencies to complete a task with no training on teamwork are often produce lower levels than teams that are trained in teamwork skills. 
So the secret sauce to team effectiveness is being trained on teamwork skills. Because that's where you build the cognition. So like you were saying, who, who has what skills within the team? Who has what experiences, what techniques, what technologies, or who, who knows how to do something? So when you start becoming familiar with the other team members and you're working with them, then you instead of asking who has this capability, you know exactly who to go to, and that makes helps things flow a lot quicker within the team. So I think some training, cool. yeah, training and identifying what competencies are required for your context, and then training to those competencies is what teamwork training is all about. I just want to add, and, and I've had experience with this with teams in the past that I've coached in organizations, is that some teams get on really, really well. They're best friends. They'll go out and play sports together or go for a beer night, you know, game night out. And they're absolutely fantastic colleagues. Put them together in a work context that are awful. They're terrible teams because they don't know how to interact within the context that Ponch was talking about. And, and so you need to train them within their context, but you also need to teach them how to communicate and, and how to plan, how to brief, how to debrief. We hear people talking about retrospectives, but retrospectives typically miss a lot of the detail because they didn't collect the detail on the journey with what we call real-time narratives and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So we need real-time capture during the period of work, a week or two or whatever the period is, so we can debrief effectively, effective debriefing on this, which came from work from Scott Tannenbaum and, and others that Ponch has interviewed. Um, but planning, I mean, the amount of companies we're going to have can't tell you how they plan. Well, we get in a room, we talk, and we come up with a plan. But no, how do you plan? Explain your planning process. And they don't have a disciplined way to brief and plan and execute together and continuously debrief in real time. And the daily scrum or daily stand-up, if you're a Toyota person, is a debriefing and planning section to brief for the next 24 hours. But there's very little discipline in these, these types of techniques. This can be taught and learned and become, become repetitive. And then things like closed loop communication, which Punch knows all about is being a pilot. If the guy sitting behind you in his context or in front of him, I forget which way he flew in planes, but if, if you're flying in a commercial airline, you've got two pilots at the front, you better hope those folks know about closed loop communication, challenge response communication. I have control. You have control. What did you say? Um, and, you know, oh, sorry, we're in a, now in a dive. Mm -hmm. So this type of thing, these are the types of skills we need. We teach to teams in business, and in the corporate and the nonprofit, the organizational world, because that's how they become much more effective in the way they build their relationships and they actually deliver work and deliver value together. And nobody teaches this. You can go learn Scrum and different agile frameworks, project management tools, uh, Lean Six Sigma, a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's all about methods and tools. None of it's about human interactions, behavioral science, team science, right. human factors. Even design thinking looks at what customers want and Punch wants to add something. Yeah, it's <laughs> the, the platitudes too. We need to communicate better. We need to respect yeah. each other. Let's go do it. Ready, break. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And coming from, you know, my background in, you know, organizational learning and development, you know, communications and feedback are always, you know, on the top of the list, but I tend to giggle a little bit and goal setting as mm -hmm. well and creating a consistent approach. But I tend to giggle a little bit when the ask is, let's have a consistent way to do this. Like human beings don't consistently mm -hmm. have a communication mechanism, mm -hmm. right? We all interpret the world differently. And so what might be consistent is really understanding that we are different, <laughs> we are inconsistent, and that we are complex beings. And that's what mm -hmm. creates complexity, right? Is that we are a bunch of complex beings working in an organization expected to really communicate, but we haven't been taught how to create the bridge to that communication. Um, in such a way that actually makes it effective and makes it easy and safe for us to then move on to that feedback. And I know that in the flow system, you introduce some models uh, that really do focus a lot on creating those feedback loops as well. And that's a really important piece to this. So when you think about, you know, communication and feedback, uh, and a goal setting aside, um, but communication and feedback keep kind of being at like the forefront of this. How do we untap those gold mines through the flow system? What kind of 
systems, approaches, methodologies, you know, what do you have inside that system that really can help these organizations team through communication and feedback? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So in every, uh, okay, so we have storytelling, uh, we have the OODA loop, we have Kinevin. So we have some advanced frameworks in there. Uh, and then on the team science stuff, we know how to, you know, radical candor, we know how to uh, establish that. We know how to uh, use or create psychological safety or, and create that fearless organization so everybody can admit to mistakes and all that. We understand uh, human vulnerability. We have different ways to do it, but what we don't do is come out and say, here's your checklist on how to do it. Um, we can, I can give models and, I, and, and we, we've had the, the Toyota planning process and the San Juan planning process uh, we built in, in Puerto Rico. Um, but what that does, it allows us to use their context, their language and say, okay, we know that high performing teams anticipate the future. We know that uh, uh, in a complex environment, we wanna separate our outcomes from the decisions we made as a team, right? So uh, we can use the OODA loop to help explain that. We can use the Kinevin framework to help explain that. And we can also use team science and the lessons and distributed leadership like psych safety and, and blend them together and go, this is what we're talking about. So the way, what makes us different from another organization like a David Marquet or, or somebody who's talking about the uh, uh, Aristotle project out of uh, Google is yes, psych safety is very, very important. How do you do that? How do you create that right. in all of the events that you're going to do in a team life cycle? So talking about it is one thing. Uh, we get a lot of books about it and you know, we get these different stages of that. Show me how to do this today. And that's very important, especially in this remote environment we're in. So um, there are a lot of tools, uh, and I think John may have some more that he can talk about, but what I'm doing is being a chef here and taking from here to here, and it depends on the context again. What, what do we talk about? What do these guys know? Um, and then let's try to relate it to them. Right, and just to hit home that concept of context, the context can be different per team per unit. So you can have a unit that has 20 teams, but each of them is working in a different context because they're, you know, solving different problems, for example, right? And they need different tools and mechanisms. And that's why there is no one size fits all. That's why consistency is very hard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because we're human, we kind of struggle with it a lot. And so we need to regularly equip people with this. Uh, so I know that the the flow system has, you know, the first stage of introducing all of these concepts. Now we also have a potential future where there is going to be a mastery track as well with the flow system that will allow people to move beyond that first stage of understanding these different tools for different contexts. Where do you take people that are on that journey for mastery? And is it mastering all pieces or is it mastering some? What does that look like? Because this is fascinating stuff. And we all need it and we all want it. Yeah. How do we get it? Uh, I, I'll, be, I'll be first to say that uh, we'll, we will all be students of the flow system. There's, I don't know if we'll ever get to a level of mastery. And, and if, if uh, I don't think any one of us, even, even the, the, the folks that are contributing to it, they're gonna be masters of, of one awesome thing. But collectively, I, there's no way any of us could be a master of the flow system. And that's the beauty of it is we, we get to learn. It's, it's about continuous learning, too. I'll, I'll flip that back over to John, maybe, maybe see what he thinks about that. Mm -hmm. Well, the initial way we have it set up is we have the foundations course. So that talks about, covers what's in the flow guide. And so that goes over all the tools and techniques within each of the three helixes. And then from there, we go to the five advanced courses and that, that's in lean thinking, flow thinking, complexity thinking, distributed leadership, and team science. So we would recommend people to take the foundations and then take each of the five advanced courses. And then once you go through the advanced courses, depending on which area you're less familiar with, you wanna focus on your weak areas, then choose that master track so that you can balance out your, your skills and knowledge. And then once you get through a master track, then you can go to another one and kind of work your way around. But that's the general process that we would recommend people taking. Go through the foundations, then the five advances, and then choose one of the master tracks that will benefit you and your organization the most. Right. I, I want to add something as well, CJ, is that um, I'm 
vehemently opposed to pyramid selling schemes of certification. Yeah. I have been a trainer for various different organizations. I still am a trainer for, for one of the, the key organizations or a licensed trainer. What we don't want to do is just create another, here's another bunch of certificates. Here's another bunch of classes you can pay money for. We are building a learning and development system that allows people to study themselves, to achieve these levels of mastery themselves without paying to do this. Yes, there'll be opportunities for, I mean, I've already taught one of the classes, the, the first foundations class before the whole virus shut the world down, unfortunately, but um, I'm giving some remote learning to people who have asked me. We have our Slack community where people share and bounce a lot of ideas that you're familiar with. Um, we're going to enable uh, people to be able to study these topics themselves. And if they want to achieve a level of accreditation for attaining a certain level of knowledge, and some of that will come with peer review and panel or interviews and, and sort of the ability to reflect back to panel re reviewers, how they've applied the concepts and constructs and how they've benefited and, and what the application of that is. Uh, 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 provided within organizations they're working in, we will give them that opportunity to, let, to get different levels of accreditation. John at the University of North Texas is working on an MBA program, which will be a separate, nothing to do with us commercially, completely separate program of education as a proper degree course and a proper degree qualification in a recognized uh, national university in the USA. So we, we want this to be a learning capability, a system of this learning and understanding. Yes, there'll be opportunities to get some formalized uh, recognition in that. This is not our prime and facier focus. We want to establish, we want to break the existing standard paradigms of this framework and that framework. You summed it up a little while ago by saying that organizations are full of people. People are complex adaptive systems. You never know one minute to the next what folks are going to do and how we're going to react. That's complexity. It's unpredictability. And so an organization is a complex adaptive system full of complex adaptive systems. Right. So how the hell do standardized linear approaches are supposed to function in that? A yeah. fixed framework, a prescriptive methodology, you know, a project management approach, it doesn't work unless you've got work in Toyota, Toyota were very good at distilling mechanical tasks, task work into standard work, which is standardized repeatable activity, and then optimizing the supply chain, leveling it, the, the, uh, uh, something called high junker, leveling the workflow so that you've got this one piece continuous flow with minimal variation or acceptable variation. And that's where the concepts of Kanban to, to control inventory and things came around. So the thing is this, it's impossible for us to say, here's a template for an organization. We will enable learning in various different ways, both online, self-paced, computer-based, or whatever they call it, you know, video learning, as well as formal training. We'll have a trainer network. So this will start to grow over time. But our prime focus is to present industry with a way to manage complexity with new leadership and embrace and enhance team science and bring these three things together, not lose our foundational knowledge, which goes back decades, bring all this together into a flow based approach. Um, and just on your untapped gold mines thing, it's about leveraging unarticulated need as Dave Snowden talks about a great deal. And some of the tools in the complexity helix, if people look at them, sense making and weak signal detection, how are you going to detect the inflection points that you as an organization need to see. And if they look at Dave Snowden's apex predator theory, same idea, organizations reach a certain inflection point and they either inflect and pivot or they crash and burn and, and die. Kodak, Nokia, you know, uh, and all these sort of organizations. And so the tools are in there to help organizations detect that. And I wrote a piece the other day on some work by some earlier professors in the nineties about disruptive innovation. And how do you become the disruptive innovator? How do you leverage these complexity tools and the other elements of the other three, uh, the, the, the triple helix to be able to become that new disruptive innovator and pivot and be out there leading the world? And if you're in that blue ocean, red ocean strategy book that was written, do you want to be in that sea of piranhas fighting for the customers? Or do you want to be in that crisp, clear blue ocean, that beautiful area and actually innovating and disrupting the market? 
Because if you fall into that disrupted imitator space where you're playing catch up to the Teslas and the others of this world, then you're burning cash faster than you can print it just to buy or acquire or learn or catch up with the technology or the innovations. So these are the tools in the complexity helix, which will give you those untapped gold mines, leveraging that team science to be able to adapt and deliver them. And that's when you start to, to uh, sort of focus on unarticulated need. I just thought they were relevant points mm -hmm. from some of the things you were mentioning a short while ago. It's fantastic. Um, so to, to sum up as well, if, if a leader is identifying <laughs> finally that they are dealing with a complex adaptive system, which pretty much any organization is that has human beings at the helm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and human beings that are not beyond like the top, the, the three people that are, you know, leading every decision. Um, so if we, we know that we're in a complex adaptive system, the flow system provides a number of different tools and techniques and mechanisms to be able to, you know, respond to the context that you're in, adapt based on the needs and pull from and create almost like a choose your own adventure way forward, right? But with flow. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to pluck from here and I'm going to pluck from there and I'm going to like piecemeal all these things together. They actually fit together. Yes. They complete and compromise and, and adapt and complement each other in a very fluid way. Right. And that's, I think, what's important here is that there's loads of tools available in your um, foundations as well as your advanced. But at the end of the day, it's about context and flow. Right. So the way I like to think of it is this is it provides coherence for what a team is doing or organization is doing. So if you're teaching or coaching something that uh, you learned at a, at a agile conference and you come back and say, this is the greatest, the latest and greatest thing. Um, you can look at the flow system and say, okay, is this really coherent? Does it fit with complex adaptive systems? You know, the lessons we're learning from distributed leadership and team science. If not, then throw it out the door. It's, it's, it's useless. It's, it's a way, it's, it's a case-based approach that somebody thought they saw somewhere. So that, that's how I do it. And, and something else, somebody asked me the other, just yesterday, uh, you know, how do you get people to, um, uh, your level of expertise? And what do you tell them if they go, hey, this is just too much for me? Well, the bottom line is this, you don't have to know everything in the flow system. You need to know that we know it when we're coaching you and then what we're going to back it up. Right. So, but we're, right. at the same time, we're building people up to, to get to that level where they can go, okay, now we can go off and go coach and train another organization. But right. something I'll do with um, other coaches is go, okay, if I show you something, you deviate from that and you come back and show me what you did. I'm going to ask you, how does that fit with this? How does that fit with uh, the Kinevin framework? How does it fit with psych safety, the triggers that we need to shift our identity intelligence uh, from, from th throughout the day? So if they can't answer that, and th then I go, okay, let's take a look at the way you're coaching them and then just bring it back to where we had a baseline earlier. And then there are times we're going to be wrong too, right? Right. And what? I mean, I think the reality is we need to adapt to our context all the time. And that might mean that we're adapting the tools that we have to be extremely relevant, yeah. but we need to know those tools in order to do that. Yeah. So a complex adaptive system, and I'm quoting Dave Snowden here, and I'll probably paraphrase it badly, but a complex adaptive system can only be worked in if it constantly decomposes and recomposes. So it's constantly deconstructing itself and recomposing, responding to its environment. Patterns are emergent. Learning is emergent. Agility is emergent. All these things are emerging properties. Problems are emergent. So right. you can't have a fixed plan for things that you can't predict. Right. These things emerge. So as this system is constantly emerging and adapting and changing, so do the agents, the people, the machines, the tools, the techniques need to continuously evolve, emerge, change based upon the emergent context. And nothing more so than trying to challenge the coronavirus at the moment in the middle of this crisis. We are learning as things emerge and we're having to adapt our tools and approaches based upon what we're learning. Go try apply, you know, scale agile framework or, or, you know, scrum per se or project management methodologies to solving the coronavirus and you will lose really quickly. And in fact, the fact that people like the Fed in America have managed to, 
uh, approve medications in 48 hours, which normally take five years, shows how you need different leadership, different techniques, different decision-making groups. And that's what businesses need. That's what organizations need. If they truly desire to be agile or to become agile, to be more flexible, more adaptable, they have to deal with complexity, both within the products and services they're delivering, within their marketplaces in this globalized, digitized world, and within their human factors, the people right. within the organization. And unless they understand these various different constructs and concepts in this triple helix, they are going to struggle to optimize the flow of whatever they think they need to make, produce, service, and deliver to somebody who's standing there with a checkbook willing to buy whatever they're selling. Right. And so that leaves me with another question, and that is, when in flow, everything's moving seamlessly and we are moving towards that end goal, whatever that is, we're pivoting along the way if needed, if the goal isn't relevant anymore. And that's, I mean, that's what Scrum kind of came about for in the first place, right? You know, we wanted to minimize this like 18 month cycle of going from, we want this to you have this and no, it no longer works. Mm -hmm. So we're moving through this cycle. We're in flow. And we're adapting as we need to. We're using the tools and techniques that we've been given. Um, and we're adapting those if we need to. How do we then communicate that upwards and instill the confidence when, let's say, the CEO who is not in that flow system on a day-to-day -day basis wants some details. And that CEO wants to know how they got there. And it's different for every team within the organization because they are adapting to each unique context that each of them has. How do we communicate that upwards without feeling messy? I'm, I'm going to fall back on some of my good old lean teaching because, you know, some of this is not that difficult here. So first of all, we do need participatory and engaged leadership. We do need communication structures between multi-team systems and different levels of leadership. And John, as a major part of the work in the book is about John explaining different leadership models that apply. The boundary spanner, which sounds really wonderful. It sounds like some super scrum master if there's any agile folks listening, but it is right. not a super scrum master. The way I actually describe it is repurposing management. You get all this middle layer of management that are a bit detached and a bit lonely and a bit confused about what their role is we need to repurpose them into an army of problem solvers into people who solve problems for teams and and keep that team cohesion together keep focus on interim goals or distal goals the goals more distant from the team the organizational goals the purpose of these things happening and many other things that the book will cover in, in this boundary spanner type of functional management role um, but at the end of the day the, the, the biggest lessons that came out of Toyota for me is visualization, visual control. Right. The amount of people who hide things purposely or subconsciously in laptops and, and other, mm. people are obsessed with big data. And there was a good article the other day about big data, thick data, and this thing called useful data or usable data. Yeah, mm. Having lots of data is pointless. It's not much use to you unless you can synthesize and make sense of what data is useful to you. But with this whole thing, thrust towards digital transformation. And that's a misnomer. Digital is an enabler. Just digitizing your business doesn't make any difference at all. Right. Just an enabler. And digitizing things sometimes doesn't actually have any benefit. And I went into an organization the day, said, we want to do a digital transformation. I said, you're all online. You're a digital business. So what do you, what do you, what perception is a digital transformation for you? Because that's right. what you are already. So digital is an enabler, agility is emergent. But effectively, in visual control, whether you're using digital tools to visualize uh, work with, there's two rules in visual control. What do I need to do my work? Uh, what do I need to know to do my work? And what do I need to show other people? And so if you set up a Kanban board, a physical board, a scrum board, a digital Jira display, rally version one, whatever sort of, you know, tool of the demonic possession you want to use, yeah? Um, they are all tools of demons, I'm telling mm -hmm. you now. Um, but because uh, they're all misused and abused and people yeah. then start saying things like, I can't do that, Jira won't let me. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, then stop using Jira because then go do it because you're a human being, you have a mm -hmm. brain and you have a ability to do the work. 
you can't allow the tool to stop you. So this is the danger with, you know, fixation bias and other things, you know, getting, you know, automation bias, which is one of the famous ones. People die because they, they follow the screen displays and they forget that, that, that bad things are happening because they're so fixated on the display they're looking at. Um, but essentially, the, the two rules are, what do I need to have available to me that I can see that allows me to be able to function and do my work or with the team to do their work? So your simple Kanban board in Scrum to do doing and done or some other visual control that makes visible your plan. You've made a plan. You've laid out the plan for this short period of work. How are we following that and how do we continuously update the plan and keep it visible so we know what we're all doing and what the current condition of the work is? Plain old Kanban does that and you don't need any fancy Kanban university or any fancy certifications to use a bunch of sticky notes, sticky notes on a whiteboard. Uh, and then the next thing is, what do I need to visually radiate? What do I need to display that's valuable to the leadership? My old boss at Toyota Nakashima-san used to say, you know, visualization for visualization's sake is just wallpaper. It's just window dressing. I've got this wonderful board with all these values and things on it, but who cares? I need to see what is valuable to me. What is the progress towards the next deliverable or the next goal we've agreed or the next outcome that we've agreed? And what do I need to see so I'm aware of that? And if you've got the digital tools, you can make that visible on a web page that's updating nonstop. Right. And then the CEO, if he wants to know, can take a look. Uh, or any level of management can take a look. There's no need to spend all Friday morning doing a load of glossy PowerPoints, a load of Excel nonsense to report up the chain, stuff that happened a week ago. Right. What we really want to know is what, what the outcomes are in real time and what our current plan looks like and what our, what our condition towards that current plan looks like. Because um, in the old project management world, there's a technique called green shifting. Um, and I'll give Craig Larman the, 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 the sort of credit for coming up with that phrase, where every week your status report is green. And then you get to a week or two or whatever it is before you have to launch the product service into production or whatever the words are, go live. And the status is red. Because all this has been lies at best, creative writing, well, lies at worst, creative writing at best. Because we've been telling the world everything was great and dandy and because uh, we have no psychological safety. There's no active listening going on at leadership level. We have a culture of fear. We're suppressing, you know, what's called the common knowledge effect from Kathleen O'Connor at Cornell, where she says that you hire all these great people with great talent. And then nobody's willing to call out the elephant in the room because they've got no psychological safety. So right. everybody just nods and agrees with which is common knowledge, what's also known as groupthink. When the boss says we're okay and everybody goes, yeah, 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 we're okay, boss. Actually, they're all screaming inside, we're doomed, but they're afraid, afraid, afraid to speak out. Once you get into this visual control world, all this becomes transparent and open. And what you then need is better leadership with leaders intent, with active listening, with psychological safety, with this distribution of, of, of uh, decision making, because then leaders enable people to make mistakes, learn from them rapidly, recover from them. And then the leaders come in either as boundary spanners or executives, true leaders and say, how do I help? How do I remove these impediments, these blockers, these things in your way? How do I solve the problems for you so you can maintain flow of value? And that's right. a whole new dynamic. The reason that Agile is failing and Scrum is failing per se, Scrum is in the flow system, yeah? The variant that I sort of designed Scrum the trade away, which is the basics of Scrum combined with some lean thinking and some other sort of the tools that we've discussed. The reason it's in there is because it is a very good technique. But the challenge with these basic frameworks, they don't teach complexity thinking. They don't teach these tools. They just say we're, we're, we're a mechanism to do teaming around or planning around uh, complex products, but they don't actually teach complexity thinking and science. And they don't teach teams how to be teams. They, te they te tell teams you're going to be a small group of people bolted together with different skill sets and then say, go be a scrum team. Right. Uh, ow. Yeah. <laughs> and and they give them ceremonies to follow yeah, yeah, as their yeah, checklist. Here, here, you know, your sprint planning, your backlog grooming, your retrospectives. Good. You're done. Right. So these, these, I, I will correct. They're called events <laughs> just for the purists out there and, and refinement, not grooming now. But mm -hmm. you're right. They give them functional techniques. 
right. but they don't teach them how to have human interactions, the shared cognitions, the behaviors, the shared mm. mental models, the conflict resolution, and all these skills that are part of team science. And if you don't teach these things, and let's be honest, most leadership teams don't know how to do these things. Right. And if they don't, then you're looking at the leaders going, that's how I need to behave, yeah? Mm. Yep. Because if they're behaving in a shout at you sort of mode, an aggressive mode or some not nice way, then you go, but that's how to get on in life. Let me behave like that. Just right. as you're a role model to your children, if you smoke heavily and drink heavily and take drugs and swear a lot, your kids are going to look at you and go, that's a cool way to be a parent. I want to be like my dad or my mom and I'm going to swear and take drugs and drink a lot. And, and you know, so it's the same thing. Leadership is about... Uh, exhibiting the characteristics and behaviors that you wish others to exhibit and, and follow and be like you. So you need to behave like you want them to behave. I'm going to stop talking. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll just more towards your, your question. So the, it's not necessarily reporting up or reporting down and that kind of comes into more of the distributed leadership model. Okay. And then we're focusing more on leadership and less on management. So we want to instill leadership. Okay. And with that, it comes trust and psychological safety. And then that's where the leader's intent comes into play, where the leader identifies a desired state, but he has the trust in the team and the boundary spanners below them that they'll get close to that desired state. They may have different obstacles that they have to deal with, but they have the freedom to manage as they see fit to get close to that desired state. And the leader accepts the end result, even though it may or may not be exactly what they envision, but they understand that that's, that's where they are because of the conditions. And so it's a level of trust on both ends and it's more distributed throughout and it's not just up or down. And it's no accountability, it's, it's shared responsibility. Right, and that, sorry, go ahead. No, he said it much better than me. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, that brings me to a couple, uh, a few quotes that I wanna close with that are from your book. So leadership is a process that fosters emergence, it doesn't command it. Mm -hmm. Leadership can be fostered by creating the right structures, by enabling safe learning environments and through training both the individual and team levels. Organizations must choose the best leadership theories that work for their contextual setting at each organizational level. And that will and possi quite possibly include at each individual team level, probably. I inserted that little bit there. Yeah. Um, team effectiveness is a product of teamwork, task work, and the value delivered to the customer. And the total capabilities of the team are greater than the individual team members' capabilities. And teamwork is the secret sauce to effective teams. So if we take away anything um, that is very clear from this call, um, from this session, and there's so much. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. For me to go and like summarize the highlights is going to take me twice as long, but I'm, I'm more than happy to do it because I'm so grateful that you've shared as much as you have um, and given your time to it. But to, to sum it up, you know, the flow system is really enabling those leadership theories that enable that emergence in context for the teams to really truly lean into teamwork in a way that we have not been taught today mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um how how does that sit with all of you thumbs up good okay i've got some thumbs up awesome so if there's one last thing that any other any of you want to say with regards to you know what else do our leaders need to learn when we reflect on how do we come out of this covid situation and leverage the flow system to get us there what might that be yeah i want to take a stab at this one right now there's a lot of people using the language of complexity or the language of flow and wrap it around their their existing 7s models or their models from 15 20 years ago so they're trying things harder and harder using the new language. Um, to me, that's one of the biggest threats to organizations is they, they hear the language of flow, the flow system, and go, well, this must be it. Well, dive a little bit deeper and make sure you're getting um, true the flow system and not 
what others are resell, reselling as, as a, you know, under, under a new language. Um, so that's my caution out there. Excellent. Any other would, final words? I would say when you're dealing with complexity, if you don't focus on what you know, you focus on what you don't know, mm -hmm. the unknowns. And we hope with the, the flow system that we're offering a new toolbox for people to venture into that unknown realm. Absolutely. Uh, uh, my final comment really is that, and this came from a conversation with a very large supermarket chain, let's just say that in the last few days, um, is that we need to be, organizations need to be thinking, I'm not talking about making a five year plan, but organizations mm -hmm. need to be looking and thinking about now what they want to be doing in five years from now, not what they're doing tomorrow. They need the tools and techniques to enable them to function in the chaos we're in. They'll gradually make sense of this as they work through complex problems and get us back into some level of normality in that sort of linear world. But then they need to be looking, the world's changing. The way we, we operate will change, the way we live will change, the way commerce is going to work for the next few years certainly is going to change with the, the huge catastrophic impact of the economy we're in. So organizations need to be looking, what is their inflection point? What is their disruptive innovation? How are they gonna create customers when none exist today? What are the products and services we're going to need to consume in the future? And I'm afraid they're not gonna figure that out with an agile framework. It just mm. isn't there for them. They've gotta start learning some of these tools and some of these techniques. And, and investing some time in their people and understanding how they're going to start to function as complex adaptive systems to achieve these outcomes in their future. Perfectly said. So uh, to, to wrap up then in terms of taking that leap, taking that action, where can leaders who are listening to this find you, start to engage in this conversation and <laughs> call you <laughs> and bring forward uh, their organizations through this flow system and really start to adapt to this ever-changing world that the flow system is providing some answers to? And like Ponch said, not necessarily all the answers. Some of it may not work, right? So Where do they find you? So the flow guides are online. The flow guide is online. It's completely free resource, just like the scrum guide. Flowguides.org.org. .org. Uh, I'm sure you'll publish links anyway. If they I will. Google it, they'll Google it. They'll find it in the first couple of results. The flow guide is free of charge. It's a 14. Uh, it's in 14 different languages now, including an audio guide for those that prefer to listen to it or to, to find auditory, auditory le uh, learning easier. Uh, more languages are on the way. There's, there's, it's translated into Asian languages and into Arabic and into some Slovakian type languages or some Eastern European, lang European languages, as well as Portuguese and Spanish and various others. So, so flowguides.org is the key one. Um, there are, the book will be out, uh, all, all things being equal, probably May, end of May, June time, John? I would say end of June, around there, yeah. Yeah, so early summer, the book will be out and that will be available from all good online booksellers uh, and various other places of that nature. Um, there is a new website in progress for the Learning Academy. So people who want to learn more about the, uh, the curriculums, the learning. If people are interested in training, they can reach out to any of us. Um, we'll look, give, give you some information to put with the video when you, you post it. Uh, but also they can engage in our Slack community. We have a very a thriving, it's all completely free of charge, a thriving community. Uh, people like Dave Snowden are in there and the, one of the creators of DevOps is in that community. There's a number of extremely talented people, far greater knowledge than I'll ever have in that community. So we'll give you a link because it's too long to describe. You can click on and, and sign up and just participate or just, just browse the different threads. A lot of valuable learning in there. So there's a number of things there. If people want our help on a, if they really do want us to, to start having community conversations with them, we've set up a system where they can book a free one hour consulting, consulting consultancy session with any of us. Uh, again, I'll provide you a link. It'll be easy just to give you a link where they can click on that and they can book to suit their calendar a one hour video call with us just to talk about, hey, would this fit in our context? And is there anything valuable? And, and I've been having a few of those phone calls or those video calls uh, with some major corporations in the last few weeks. And they're, they're free of charge. They're just a conversation. 
Excellent. Thank you for all of that. And I thank all three of you for taking this time. We've gone over time. So I thank you for that as well. I apologize for that. Uh, but this has been so rich. And I do hope all of those who listen to this either, you know, in the near future or far future, that you do reach out because this is I would say a, a way forward through the unknowns that inevitably are going to be ahead for everybody. So thank you again. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, CJ. Thanks, thank CJ. You.